You are watching or listening to episode 111. 111, three ones. By the way, I still, that's like, a, that's literally 110 more than I thought we'd get to. And we'll, we'll get to that again soon. But 111 of the Unnecessary Nonsense podcast. On this episode, we can talk about AEW Rampage, AEW Dynamite. We can talk about Ric Flair, unfortunately, question mark. And of course, there will be, you know, the requisite time, the soliloquy where Dave Turnbull will tell us, or Dev Aid, as uh, you may know him on the internets, uh, he can tell us a little bit about how Jenny McCarthy is the greatest actress of all time. That and more on this episode of the Unnecessary Nonsense Podcast. <laughs> Continuity. I'm Carlos, and that's Dev Aid. First, I actually thought about typing my name in as that today. Did you? But I, I thought I would go with the consistency, but I did think about that. Maybe we'll just switch it. Why not? There you go. That would never happen. Please right? continue. Oh, if people would, you know, people who didn't see the last two weeks ago, they don't know. Uh, yeah. So let's talk some wrestling, Carlos. Yeah. So we got the two things. So which one do you want to touch on first? Well, you got here's, here's my thing. So if, you, if you've been following the wrestling news, which I know you have, mm-hmm. uh, this has not been a good couple of weeks for Ric Flair. Nope. Uh, right. Uh, first of all, it's the allegation of sexual assault uh, from the plane ride from hell episode of Dark Side of the Ring. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they play his comments uh, where he called into the Howard Stern show uh, in regards to Chris Canyon, who mm-hmm. was uh, m- for most of his wrestling career uh, in the closet as a gay man. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, but that, then, and, that, uh, and that's secondary is from the most recent Dark Side of the Ring, which is the Chris Canyon episode, which touches on that as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And and so he he did come out at the end of his career, uh, but then WWE fired him. And Ric Flair, he was doing some work on the Howard Stone, Stern show and Ric Flair called into the Howard Stern show to basically say uh, he was shit. And that's why they fired him. It had nothing mm-hmm. to do with why he was gay. All right. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and then Ric Flair has put out some tweets being like, you know, I was just told in the company line, like, you know, I really wish it hadn't hit him that much. I didn't understand and yada, yada, yada. Right. Mm-hmm. So here's my thing. He's getting hit so hard, a double whammy. And I don't, I don't need to talk about the plane ride from hell. I think mm-hmm. that's kind of dealt with and out there and, and whatnot. But, but it's this one that gets me because in the same episode, there's, there's, I wouldn't say substantial time, but enough time given to basically John Cena doing the same thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and the match against the Undertaker, where the Undertaker basically just destroys him with like fifty thousand chair shots. Not quite that many, but yes, forty nine thousand you know, nine hundred ninety eight. Yes, yeah, right. So I I was wondering because I'm like, okay, they, they this episode there's been a lot of flack for Flair over this, and I mm-hmm. think justifiably so. Where's the flack for John Cena? They where's the flack it. for the Undertaker? It's not, there's nothing like if you, if you, you know what, if you search Ric Flair, Google Ric Flair, mm-hmm. boom, that's what comes up, right? Some version of, of the, these stories. You Google Undertaker, it's all about his new Netflix thing he's doing with WWE, where it's like the new day is trying to get his urn and it's like a choose your own adventure horror movie. And you Google John Cena, it's all about his movie career. There is nothing about this. And I, and my thing is, okay, if you're going to give flack to Ric Flair for the Chris Canyon thing, do it. But I think if you're going to give him flack, because basically it's because of this episode. If this episode didn't air, people aren't talking about it. Mm-hmm. So then where's the flack for Cena? Because he basically did the exact same thing. Okay. Right? So, in a, in, in, just out of curiosity, where? so when you say where is, where would you be looking for it? Flack-wise. So, all right. So here's what I've done. And this is, I didn't go too hard on this, but if I Google, and I'm going to do it right now. So I'm just going to Google Ric Flair. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And and I'm you just click, Google their name. Yeah. And I'm going to click news. Okay. Okay. Boom. First thing that comes up, which I've actually looked at, Ric Flair clarifies earlier comments about Chris Canyon ahead of Dark Side of the Ring. Sure. Second story, Ric Flair apologizes for Chris Canyon comments. Mm-hmm. Third story, Ric Flair's issue statement on previous comments about Chris Canyon. Mm-hmm. Right. And then there's things about, so th- four of the five top hits for news on Ric Flair have specifically to do with Chris Canyon. No, I follow you. I guess. Okay. So we're talking about we're talking about mainstream news outlets here. Yeah. Well, Wrestling Inc., the Sportster. That, that, that's headlines. why I wanted. That's why I wanted to be clear. So that's not really mainstream. Now, okay. now do you see what I put on the screen? No, because I'm looking at Google. Right? Like, okay. So where is this? I did not see this. I want to. Ringside, this is Ringside News. Okay. So, I go so to John, if I go John Cena, I just want to see what comes up now because it's been a couple of days. Yeah. Now okay? the thing. So, 
Hold right. on. So if I go and do the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, there's all stories about John Cena and starring in a movie with Kathy Bates. It's a political thriller. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if I go Undertaker, okay, uh, it I've got the uh, trailer for his Netflix thing, which I talked about. Ten great Undertaker matches that nobody talks about. Escape the Undertaker trailer. Help the New Day survive. Da 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 da. And then it's like all his his stuff. Totally. Now, quickly, uh, this is a good education piece. I totally get your point, but I just want I want to help out a little bit here. This is a good right. education piece for everybody. Okay, so I opened up Google. I typed in John Cena, and I opened up the news section. Yep, just news that, specific. That is, that is what I got as well. Okay, cool. So here's the deal. So you can see very similar to what uh, Dave's talking about. And if you can't see it, don't worry about it. You just need to understand that it's a, ver a variety of different articles. If you go to the Google News tab, this is what you normally would look at. Now, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Suicide Squad goes viral, B BT, uh, BTM member on RM and Twitter, blah, 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 blah. Okay. PW Mania, John Cena trends on social media after fans attempt to cancel him. Question, uh, you know, in quotes. Scroll down a little bit more. W John Cena, WWE firing demanded by fans. Now, Google does it based on trends. They do it based on the amount of hits that these sites get. It's, not, it's a chicken or the egg thing. There has to be enough tra Ric Flair at this point has already been under fire so much that anything Ric Flair, they'll throw it right at the top. They'll throw it like on the front page. John Cena has, John Cena's kind of just been doing his movie thing for a while. John Cena is getting flack, but at the same time, um, kind of in a bigger story, um, professional wrestling fans are weird. Just as a general statement. But being more specific, they're inconsistent in how they wish to apply things. They, they'll say, oh, well, we like this person, therefore we'll start making excuses for them. John C the reality is John Cena's always been kind of vanilla to me, but there's no question he was very successful. But John Cena did not become a cultural icon to a certain degree the way that Ric Flair did in the second side of his career. Because when he was the NWA champion, he was super popular, but Hulk Hogan was the dude in that era. Like in the 80s, when they're like at both of their respective apexes, Rick, Hulk Hogan's the bigger star. Mm -hmm. John Cena theoretically is the bigger star. But when we think about, um, and they headline two different WrestleManias, John Cena did two WrestleManias with The Rock. Who's the star? Yep. There's two right. of them. They're both stars. Yeah. But who is the star? Uh, the Rock. Correct. John Cena's always been, John Cena is like on the second tier of like all time WB guys. His thing that's interesting. That, so we could have a different episode about John Cena's overall legacy in ring and with WB because that could be a discussion on its own. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, interesting thing about John Cena. John Cena was on top as the number one guy in WB longer than anyone in WB's history. He was on top longer than Hogan. He was on top longer than Stone Cold Steve Austin. Stone Cold Steve Austin had injuries. Hogan uh, had his apex. If you go from 1984 to about 1990, 1991, Hogan is the hottest thing going in wrestling. And they and it's like main event, main event, main event, WrestleMania main event, big match, big match, big match. Everything he's in is a big deal. They're drawing huge numbers. They do TV specials in the 80s that draw 20 million viewers. Ridiculous stuff. Big stadium shows selling out here, there, and everywhere. Huge stuff. And by the time you get to the early 90s, some of the steam is going out. So that's where they do the thing where they're going to have the Ultimate Warrior win the world title in WrestleMania 6, which is what happened. And then they were going to have him run. Obviously, that run didn't last too long. Um, he had his run with it, but then we kind of went from there. Stone Cold Steve Austin, I would say Stone Cold Steve Austin had the highest apex of anybody because when he was at his absolute tip top, he was the hottest thing going. He was on TV shows, all the, um, you know, all the different um, daytime talk shows, you know, uh, uh, you know, evening uh, variety shows and everything, they would have them on. Stone Cold Steve Austin was a household name everywhere, and they sold so many of those Austin 316 shirts. So it's like they're still making bank off those stupid things to this day probably. True. So he was the biggest star at his absolute apex. The biggest overall star is probably The Rock because in his second career post, he became the biggest movie star. Mm -hmm. So in so he took it to another level. But yeah. in ring... Stone Cold Steve Austin is the absolute apex star. Rock was really close right up there, but in his post career, he's the bigger star because of all the rest of the stuff he's done and all the successes he's had. John Cena it was, it was really consistently good, had the longest run of anybody as the wrestling star, had some success in movies too, but like his Suicide Squad did okay compared to the first one. Now, part of that is not his fault. 
Uh, his Fast and the Furious ep- is, you know, F9. The Rock was in the previous Fast and the Furious ones. Those did bank. His did okay. John Cena's a star, but he's not an uber mega star. Yeah. He's a big name. In some ways, in, in his post, you know, uh, peak career, um, you could argue that Ric Flair was a bigger was a bigger star in the sense that he was cited by so many people as an inspiration. He had the mm-hmm. shoes. He had the references in hip hop culture. Like people love Ric Flair. They would use they would use the woo and all kinds of things. And he, here's the cultural relevance to this day. When somebody does the chop, they do the woo, even if Flair's nowhere around. <laughs> like he transcended certain elements. It transcended his original career when he was actually the NWA champion doing, you know, traipsing around the country and doing all this stuff. He was a big star, but like his star was actually higher the last couple of years than it was even back then because mm-hmm. he's now the legendary Ric Flair. He's the legend Ric Flair. So he's had a lot more to hurt. Uh, John Cena's just kind of around. Like he's succeed- he's doing well. He's succeeding. He's, he's got movies and stuff. And But it's, it's not like he's an A-list star. He's not, he's not on the level of The Rock. Nowhere near. He, he's a secondary player. He's not going to star in a movie. We're not starring John Cena in this movie. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I hear. So I think that means that when me, when they make news like this, yeah, people are noticing it. More people are going to have to click on those things, and it'll move to the top of that list. But it's because it's wrestling edge. Do you know what wrestling edge is? I know a lot about wrestling, but I, I've never heard of that site. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I see. Little, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, so that's one of the ones that published that. It hasn't made the news cycle traction. Whereas Flair was already there, and this is like, oh, here's another thing with Ric Flair. <laughs> Let's tack it on. Since, well, and uh, they were the, also, they were also, you know, before the Canyon Dark Side of the Ring even aired, you know, people were like, ah, oh, this is not going to be good for Flair, this episode, right? Yeah, for sure. I think, I think the clips of uh, Cena, you know, basically trashing uh, Canyon will make some more rounds because obviously social media will get it first. That's how this works. It's real easy. Uh, wrestling fans don't get outraged about everything. So, so the problem is that their hashtags and stuff don't really hold the amount of volume or water that you would think because, yeah, you guys are upset, but you were upset when, um, I'll give you an example. One of the women in WWE is Naomi. She's very mm-hmm. talented. Um, but a lot, but they'll do like the hashtag, Naomi deserves better. And I'm sitting there like, I get your premise, but you literally think everybody deserves better. You think everybody should have the title at the same time, apparently. Maybe we should just give everybody a title. Um, and also, you're forgetting that the last maybe five or six years, Naomi's been treated as an afterthought. She's just there. Now, you're going to be like, oh, but no, she should have a run with the title. Why? There's no storyline reason for it. You haven't established anything. Also, forgetting all that, she has had runs with the title. It was not the script. It was okay. By the way, not entirely her fault. It's how you book, you're book. booked as well is, is a reflection of how this is done. They didn't do a good job making her a star when she had the title. So partially, they're, mostly their fault, I would say. Partially, she was just kind of nondescript as champion. She was kind of there. She had the title. Okay, great. Eventually, she'll go to WWE Hall of Fame because everybody who ever had a title goes to the WWE Hall of Fame. So Pretty much. Great. Yeah, as a pioneer or something. I don't know. And her gimmick is like the glow. It's like it, it's great for shirts. It's great for selling stuff to kids. I don't care. She, they could fire her tomorrow and I wouldn't notice. Nothing personal, nothing nothing mean about her, but she hasn't been treated as a star. If you don't treat them as stars and you just treat them as after, you can't just randomly snap your fingers and make them champion and now everything's going to work. That isn't yeah. how this works. You could do it, but now it would have to be, if you wanted to do it, then you're going to have to take on a six-month project. Your project is going to be, let's reestablish her, come up with something, because they, they pitched the idea of having her work uh, with her husband as part of the um, the bloodline thing with Roman Reigns. Okay, great. That's something different. Fine. So now she has a change in attitude. She takes it a little more seriously. She gets rid of all that glow crap. Doesn't do the dancing thing before every match. She's focused on winning matches. Does this for a while. Becomes the number one contender. And then wins the title. You can do that. I still think it's dumb because I think you... The problem is that a lot of these wrestling fans have like no memory. And I'm like, but you told me she's shit for years. I'm not saying she's shit, but you've told me she's shit. You know how I know this? Because I can see what you've done. I didn't forget the other episode of the show. And they do this now with Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair. They're going to, I think tomorrow is the Extreme Rules pay-per-view. And one of the matches is Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair. And my thought process was, okay, cool. 
That's a rematch from the SummerSlam thing. Um, cool. Why? Oh, but Bianca was a champion before. Cool. So what? Why did she get a rematch? Oh, well, you know, she's got to avenge herself after losing a thing. Yeah, she lost 26 seconds. Oh, but she was caught by surprise. Yeah, she was caught by surprise when Becky Lynch slowly came down. Her music played. It was a surprise that she was there. She came down, enjoyed the cheers and the adulation of the crowd, came in. Bianca Belair had already agreed to a match with Carmella that was the last minute. Becky Lynch waltzed in, basically threw Carmella out like she was yesterday's garbage. She's a former champion, by the way. She's trash. Out the, out, out the ring rope she goes. This is what happened on the show. And I didn't order the pay-per-view, but I watched the video. I, we, we've got the internet. You, you can watch it yourself. So I watch it, and then I'm sitting there, and then she challenges Bianca Belair, and Bianca Belair agrees. So she's agreed to the match. The match was a fake handshake, hit her in the, ha- hit her in the face with a punch, hit a, hit a pump handle slam, one, two, three, Becky Lynch is the champion in 26 seconds. Yeah. Sounds to me like Bianca Belair sucks. She lost in less than 30 seconds. Becky Lynch didn't cheat. She didn't use a foreign object. She didn't use the distraction. She didn't throw mist or something in her face. She literally hit her with a punch, hit her with a finishing move, and pinned her clean in the middle of the ring. And now Becky Lynch is supposed to be the bad guy because she's better than Bianca Belair. You told me she's better. Yeah. Bianca Belair sucks. I watched it with my own eyes. Whatever well, she did before, it doesn't matter. Okay. So this kind of takes me this ta- this takes me into to something else. Then can I use this Go as a it. segue, please? As, as you know, we're we're trying to get some shorter episodes in, so I want to make sure we make best use of our time. I just needed to make sure that people understood that WWE storytelling is critical to this. How you right. present these people does matter because well, this is the perception you're going to leave people with. Yeah, and that's and that's where I want to go to with with uh, AEW, right? right. Because I, I want. I'm mean, obviously this was supposed to be the biggest thing in AEW history, mm-hmm. the Grand Slam, yeah. first events in New York, mm-hmm. our shots, you know, big crowd. Uh, and and you know they did it, but they only did a modest, modestly better rating than they did the previous couple weeks on sure. uh, Dynamite. Hopefully, Rampage is better, but we'll see. I don't know if it's been released yet. I don't think it has. Not yet. I was checking uh, earlier. But my thing is, I'm so here's the thing. If we look at those two things, the card was stacked, mm-hmm. right? And for the most part, in my opinion, I'm not going to rehash a lot of what you said because you recorded a podcast about the about uh, Dynamite. Right, the Wednesday episode, and yep. I, I'm going to kind of leave that there. I have I had a, some minor disagreements with you on things, but we don't need to get into that. I think you did a good job of covering it and and going through it. Mm-hmm. So stack cards, stack matches. I think most of the matches were entertaining and and pretty good matches. But I'm I'm starting to wonder, right? Like, where is the storytelling in AEW right now? Because we had a few that finished up not too recently, uh, the MJF Jericho. Mm-hmm. Right, which went through that. That was a long story, right? That culminated mm-hmm. with the five layer uh, labors of Jericho, and then obviously, then well, then MJF beating Jericho, and then having the "I'll never wrestle again if I lose" rematch where Jericho won, and that was kind mm-hmm. of the end of the story. Sure. Uh, and I thought that was some great storytelling. But I, you know, there's where are the other really good stories right now in AEW, right? Like, what is what is CM Punk's storyline right now? It's like, well, he challenged Darby Allen because he's like, hey, I'm in AEW now and I challenge you. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of a one-off. And then it's like, okay, now I'm with Team Taz fighting the with the FTW. Is that what they call themselves? Well, it's it's Team Taz. FTW, um, I'll give you the background another day. But just remember to ask me about FTW. It's straightforward, but there's a little backstory to it. Right. That goes but back right, so he's not fighting them. And I mean, his match with, with Hobbs was pretty good, mm-hmm. I thought. Uh, yeah. And I thought, you know... It's one of those things that obviously CM Punk was going to win, but I think Hobbs acquitted himself well, and mm-hmm. and hopefully you know we'll see where he goes with that. But it it doesn't feel like there's anything that's really really like brewing as like a good storyline, right? Because you have like Britt Baker as the champion mm-hmm. for the women's division, which I think they need to do more with. They need like more women's matches because they have so much good female talent, and I don't think they're utilizing it properly. Mm-hmm. But you I mean you had you on several episodes ago basically went through a year of storytelling that they could do with Britt Baker, which I think would have been fantastic. Mm-hmm. Right. But now it just seems to be like, I'm the champion and just throw somebody else up to me so I can beat them in, you know, one, two matches, right. We'll have a couple, we'll cut a couple promos and then I'll beat them. Mm-hmm. And then on to the next one. Right. And I mean, okay. But like, that's, that's the thing is like, one of the things that I love about pro wrestling is the storytelling. 
Yeah. Right. And so the matches are good. The matches are entertaining and I'm enjoying watching the product and I'm not going to stop watching the product, but I'm, I'm, I want more storytelling, Carlos. And I want to know where you sit on this. Sure. So I'll touch on a couple of things. So the first one is I didn't expect that they would break their record rating. Um, long story short, the reason why is because you're still in the era of tribalism. There are folks who you could you could flip rosters and put the WWE folks on AEW and run the exact same story. Wow. And the WWE aren't, aren't folks would watch doing, it. Aren't they kind of starting to do that anyway? No, they're not. Because um, here's the thing. And this is. I mean, I guess the, AEW people aren't going to WWE. But. Yeah, yeah. But uh, here's the thing. No, I mean, literally flip rosters. I mean, yeah, I know, literally I know take you Roman did. Reigns, I know you did, throw him onto AEW, have him do the same thing. It's like Roman Reigns, shit. Didn't you like him five seconds ago? But that That's how this would work. It, it doesn't matter what you put on there. They they don't care. Um, I had actually done a little research and digging the other day because I was looking back at the Monday Night War. And one of the things I was looking at was the, la was the last couple of episodes. Um, Nitro was still getting like twos. Um, it was starting to drop off. The last episode got a 2.6. It was a simulcast with WWE. Um, so that was, the, this, was, this was, well, it, while it was still like Turner brand or, or now at WWE taking it over? No, no. This was the very last episode of Monday Nitro mm -hmm. because Monday Night, when, my, when, when WWE took it over, Monday Nitro ceased to exist. Okay. WWE had made the purchase. This was the last episode on TNT for my Monday Nitro. Gotcha. That okay. was the last one they were ever going to run. Um, so what they did is they did this whole simulcast thing and all that. Um, and they went in and basically made clear and they did the story where Shane McMahon was going to take it over, which eventually led to the invasion angle, which didn't really work out the way they wanted and all that stuff, whatever. Um, so anyway, so they did a 2.6 on Nitro and like a five point something on Raw. Okay. So technically 7.6 million people were watching professional wrestling that week. Gotcha. Uh, the very next week, Monday Night Raw was unopposed. The rating on it went up to like a 5.6. 2 million people evaporated. Now, Monday Night Raw would continue to do well, ratings-wise, have some good weeks. But year by year, that rating would slowly drop, slowly drop, slowly drop. Today, they get under 2 million. Mm -hmm. Where did those wrestling fans go? They vanished. They disappeared. Right now, there is a lot of not overlap between the two shows. Some of the folks are AEW only, and some of the folks are WWE only you're going to have a very hard time getting them to get because if you could get the folks that are watching because they're on two different nights you're not they're not directly competing on the same night mm -hmm. if you could get the wb folks to tune into the wednesday show as well well then you would see that rating go up but right now some of them are hell-bent on not doing it regardless of what's being presented now let's talk about storyline because that was your main point um becky lynch did a little social media post where she was poking fun at that about how you know uh, people tune into like a great story and not like a um a sunset flip or whatever it was okay um and a lot of people had a lot of fun with it because they did the thing where uh, it's like, technically, is that fair? It kind of plays into exactly what you just said, right? You know, people like to see the story in professional wrestling. This is true. Uh, but it was very funny coming from Becky Lynch. We're like, okay, what's your story? Well, exactly. Right? You had a kid. You came back. You won a title in 26 seconds. You just beat the champion who was in the main event of WrestleMania with Central Bank. So basically, the story you told me is that you're better than all of them. Because you beat her in 30 seconds, so you're better than Bianca Belair. Bianca Belair beats Sasha Banks. You're better than Sasha Banks. So she's shit. So here's the question. Why should I want to watch any of them wrestle you? Because you're better than all of them. And it's a foregone conclusion. But here's the thing. It may not be. They may flip the title back. But in which case, then none of it makes any sense. Then what was the point of the three in the first place? Yeah. If you have her beat her and you have her take a long time, it's stupid. It doesn't make any sense. If you have the only, the only thing, and people won't like this, the only storyline that makes sense here for this match is for Becky Lynch to go in there and beat her again in under a minute. And no one's going to like it. It's going to be a terrible match. It's going to suck. But it's, it only makes sense because Bianca Belair is garbage. This is the story you've told me. To reverse it now makes, makes the first match invalid. What, what, was the, what was the difference? Yeah. The element of surprise, really? A money, a money in the bank cash in is the element of surprise. Somebody waltzing down in slow motion down the ramp, coming into the ring, dispatching your potential opponent, throwing them out, and then challenging you verbally. You could have said no. So you're a moron. 
yeah. you lost but the But obviously, I mean, it's whatever the creative at WWD is. That's, my I mean, point, that's my the book. point is, though, my point is, though, I'm talking about from the audience perspective. You yeah. have told me that Bianca Belair is stupid and she sucks. This is what you have. I'm looking at what you have presented for me for this character. You have told me she is stupid and she sucks. I don't believe she's stupid and I don't believe she sucks, but this is what you're telling me. Yeah. That's the story you're telling. So, so Becky Lynch of all people should not be speaking of stories, because after her initial rise with the man, most of her run with the title was was nondescript. I couldn't tell you a damn thing she did. It was boring. But she was over. But it was boring. Yeah. It didn't lead to anything. It didn't lead to anywhere. She just had a series of titles. Now, bring it back to AEW. Britt Baker's kind of stuck in a weird spot. The only logical conclusion here is going to be the Thunder Rosa line. So really, it's a matter of trying to figure out what the timeline is. You have to work backwards. Um, Tony Khan traditionally is pretty good with this. And I'll quickly touch on some of the other storyline elements in the show. But with the women's division that you're talking about, the tricky part is they're trying to figure out timing. Their next big show is in November. So the question is, do you want to try to get Thunder Rosa in for November? Or do you want to do it a little later? Now, let me make the argument for later. I kind of want to see Britt Baker have a decent length title ring because she'd have had over a year right before her. And she's doing a great, and, by, and Britt Baker standalone is doing a tremendous job in her capacity as a champion with that. People like her as champion. She's still getting huge reactions. Uh, the matches have been solid on the whole, and she's credible as a champion. So yeah. you're doing well with that. So it's not like, do you really, you're not going to flip it just for the sake of flipping it. Thunder Rosa, though, makes a ton of sense, and I have no issue with her being the next champion, but you want to structure it. You want to set it up at a big show. You want it on pay-per-view. Very important. So the next one's in November. And then the one after that might be in January or February. So if that's true, then if you're going with that, then you basically need to do something to bide some time to get you to that next feud. You basically want to get to the mm -hmm. next pay-per-view with whoever you're going to put in that place and then have, have basically Thunder Rosa waiting in the wings for the very next pay-per-view. And then you've got some time to build to that championship match, which will be a big right. match. Set it up as a big match. Make it a big deal. And there you go. There's your title change. And great rain for Britt Baker. Awesome. Well done. And then there's Thunder Rosa gets a run now. Yeah. So there's a really good logic way to do this. The question is, what do you do in the middle? What do you put in the meantime? Right. What's, exactly. what's that thing? How do you, yeah. How do you get there? Yeah. So it's going to be very tricky because the Ruby Soho thing, she was put into that position quickly to try to establish her as a player. She acquitted herself well in the match. I don't want her to have a rematch. What I want is I want you to start thinking about something in between. Now, here's the problem. You've got credible opponents, but she's already faced a couple of them. You're not going to go back to Nala Rose. That's not going to make any sense. Um, doing a Ruby Soho rematch again, I'm not. I, I don't want her to re a rematch because then you'd have to have her lose. You want you want her to get 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 some wins and start racking them up. The only person right now available is Sheeta. Um, now, I got unless to unless you have like Jamie Hayter or Rebel turn on her. Yeah, but that's too soon for that. She she you turn you turn the you have that storyline after she loses the title. You have her take out her frustrations on her help, and then they turn on her. And then Britt Baker can be feuding with them to the side of the Thunder Rosa next feud. Right. So they can be operating multiple story. Then you get your multiple storylines at the same time. Which is Britt good. Baker's doing a thing, and then Thunder Rosa's doing a thing. You got the championship storyline, and you got Britt Baker's storyline with her with her cohorts. There you go. So I've already booked you into that. I've already gotten you into next year now. With these two so when when is aw gonna hire you to be a booker that's what well, I'm, I'm gonna have to talk to tony Connors. So, like dude i got this man i got i got you here um what i'm thinking though is i could i got a good way we can get sheeta in the thing is she has continued to keep winning she's actually got 40 wins in aw and because they count the wins her record is actually exceptional her record is actually really good and they do still have the rankings on the website and she's like second or third on the ranking mm -hmm. so she's right up there I could see you billing it up as, okay, so after a long, being the champion for a long time, Britt Baker beat her, here's Sheeta's chance at redemption to, to be, beat her and get the title back and become a two-time champion. You yeah. build it up that way. Britt Baker wins. Now, you're going to build it up to that point. Get us to November because that's your, that's your, you know, your, your women's title match for November. Build, it up, build us up towards that. Because Sheeta's already credible. She's already been champion. She's continued to win in the time since. All good. We're, we're solid there. So let's get to that match that way. And you know, in ring, she's going to be solid. She and Britt Baker already had a good match. All good there too. We're solid there. We get to that stage. We get to that point. Then Sheeta loses. 
and out of frustration, you start to see her descent to turn heel. There's a storyline element for Sheeta. So now Sheeta has a storyline element. Britt Baker rolls on to face Thunder Rosa as her next big challenger, setting that up, and then she'll have her storyline down the road. I've already set that up. And now Sheeta can have her own little thing going on too. Now I've actually given you three storylines. Take that, everybody. Yeah, what I'm, but I'm saying that the problem is it's not there right now. No, I get you. But it's one of those things, though, the timing wasn't right. You couldn't you couldn't shoehorn anything in because it's like, okay, who do you want to put in there? <laughs> like, it, it, they've got more people on the roster. This is good. Um, now, that's one alternative. Another alternative is you could open the Forbidden Dart and grab somebody from Impact. You could grab a Jordan Grace. You could grab a couple other ones and had, have them in there and set up a nice little match with Britt Baker and have kind of an inter-promotional thing going on. What would be kind of fun, I'll give you, I'll throw you one that would be kind of fun on, an, on a show if you, wanted to, if you wanted to kind of stack it a little bit. Um, you could set it up on one of those shows where you do a little uh, exhibition champion versus champion with Deanna Prazo for the impact. We, you don't have to put the championships on the line because you want both the champions to go back to their respective promotions, but have them have a nice little match on a big dynamite or something. Have them be right at the top of the card, champion versus champion, who's the better champion. Yeah. There you go. Little promotional. If, again, you're trying to buy it some time. You're trying to get us to the next pay per view, and then you're trying to then subsequently get us to the next one. Again, I'm thinking two pay per views ahead here. That's where we put Thunder Rosa. That's where you do the title switch. Make it a big deal. In 2022, year of Thunder Rosa. Get her going there. Yeah. And then you've got some opportunities and things you can do. And again, Britt Baker is already in a good spot. She doesn't need the title anymore, but let her have a good run. Because if you get her to that point, She's had a good long run, the better part of a year. Mm -hmm. That's strong. That's good. And she's headlined some big shows and had some big matches and beautiful. For first title reign, that's what you want. You want it to be nice and memorable, to have some good stuff in there. Right now, I've just built you a structure that gets you some good matches, some good opponents, have some good stuff. And then when she hands over the title, in good hands. You're off You're off and running, and then I'll go do something else for a while. Yeah. Well, like I said, man, you need to, you need to be the booker now. Yeah. It needs to happen. Now, for the rest of it, here's where you're going to be. Here's where you're going to be. Here's where you're tricky. Uh, and it kind of plays into your point. Uh, Malachi Black is a tricky one because I want because I didn't I wasn't satisfied with the way they got out of that one with that match because it feels like you're almost extending it and I don't want to see it extended. I want to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, Malachi Black needs something more interesting to do. The problem with a lot of these guys is they're all kind of they're all interesting in their own way, but a lot of them don't have specific reasons to be fighting each other. The only people that really have specific reasons to do things are the champions. The champions are kind of rolling on doing their thing. There's a lot. Of, I'd love to see a Malachi Black. And like I said, I'd love to see a Malachi back in a Miro. Maybe he gets greedy and he gets greedy eyes and he sees that title and he wants it. Malachi Black needs to have a motivation. Right now, I don't understand what his motivation is. I do know that the guy himself has a really good idea of his character. So he's probably got something in mind. I just don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, but again, I don't think Cody Rhodes should play into this. Cody Rhodes should be out of everything. Please go away. Go do something else. Um, because he, he, right now he's kind of in the way. He's kind of the, um, the fact that we have to shoehorn Cody Rhodes in here is actually what's kind of clogging up some of the works. If I remove him from this equation, it gets a lot easier because I can be like, okay, I need to focus on somebody from Miro to fight. I need to focus on this. Malachi Black and now has something else to do, something more interesting. And there you go. We could think of a Malachi Black Andrade match. That'd be interesting. That'd be cool. Th there's so many interesting possibilities. They go far beyond where they are right now. There's a lot mm -hmm. of things you could do. For sure. Um, so that'll be interesting as well. Uh, the other thing that may help a little bit with the women's division as well is that there's the rumor going around they may have a secondary women's championship. Which like makes sense. Yeah, like a TBS championship. So that in turn, so here we go. We talked about Ruby Soho where I kind of don't want her to have a rematch. I could see her competing for the first ever TBS championship if that's what they call it. Yeah. Have a little tournament that gives a bunch of these women something to do. Have a tournament where they're trying to win this new TBS championship. And then you could give it to somebody like Ruby Soho, who's an experienced wrestler, to be your first TBS champion. And then she can have her feuds. There you go. you got two different title feuds going on simultaneously. You could have one of them wrestle on Dynamite, one of them wrestle on, on, on Rampage. Yeah. And then you're consistently getting one of these titles on the show, one or both shows, all the time. Seems good. Yep. So there's, there's ways. You just have to be very clever about how you approach this. There are ways to do it. Uh, for the men's division, a lot of it is going to come down to, again, I, I honestly, I, I'm serious when I say this. Cody Rhodes is literally clogging up the works. The fact that we have to shoehorn him in somehow is, is actually hurting the situation because I, I got a bunch of these other guys that I have a lot of things that we could be doing with. That would be really interesting that we could do it. I'm kind of trying to squeeze it in. Also, um, 
the weird fixation with including a lot of the new Japan guys is kind of clogging up Moxley. <laughs> so it's like, all right, guys, um, look, unless you get me one of the absolute biggest, biggest, biggest guys, it's actually been kind of fun, though. The matches are good. The matches are solid. Exactly. But that's what I mean, right? The matches are good, but it's like, where's this, like, take it somewhere. Well, here's the thing, though. Moxley has been to Japan a lot, so, like, he actually has a story, but you need to actually flesh it out. Give me some video packages to explain it, because Moxley actually has reasons to feud with these guys. He's actually got beef with some of these Japan guys. But that's he was fair, in Japan. right? But then give it to us. Like, give us give us more storyline, right? Because there's elements of story there, and the, like I said, it's the matches are good, but I want to know more about why these guys are fighting each other and what's at stake. And then once you have a result, where is that going to take us next potentially? Sure. Right. So let me pose a question for you. Uh, I already right. outlined a couple of different scenarios and a couple of different angles. So we've done and that. Then we can, we can wrap it up with this, Carlos. Sounds good. Uh, so here's my question. Is there any specific thing other than the women's division, which I've, I've already fixed. I fixed it. Um, other than that, is there any other specific area where you're concerned that the lack of a storyline element is hurting it a bit where you're, uh, where you'd like to see some more happen? I'd like to see, well, yeah, because I'd like to kind of see more with the, like, Jurassic Express, Christian K, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. what it, because it kind of kind of started off, it made sense, and then, you know, he goes off on his own, kind of, he wins the Impact Championship from Kenny Omega, so there's a storyline that, right? It, but it just feels like, you know, they're, they're together, but we're just going to put this match here, here's another match, here's another match, here's another match, mm -hmm. and when you connect the dot, or you try to connect the dots, they don't really connect. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's fair. Um, I you think know, and Matt Hardy was part of it, but now Matt Hardy's feuding with Orange Cassidy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. There's... yeah, there's there's a bit of a disjoint there. So here, here's what I'll say. I think one of the most interesting things about this is that um, what I would like to see is I'm back to there's something clogging up the works. And right now, th this time it's not Cody Rhodes. So this time I'm not going to blame him for this one. Although he's responsible for a lot of the other clogging. But this, this time, no. Well, this he time is an EVP, right? So. Yeah, this time it's not him. Um, I think the issue is, and we'll see if this is true. The rumor is that um, Wyndham Rotunda, uh, formerly Bray Wyatt, aka, mm -hmm. uh, may be coming in as soon as this next week. Okay. Uh, now that's the rumor. We never know. Again, we'll see. If he does, if he may be doing something with the Dark Order, in which case they have actually had a storyline going, but nobody's really paying attention to it. They've had like their dissension uh, yep. be amongst themselves. He could then be there in that group just a little. Part of the reason the rumor is going is that I believe next week they're in Rochester. And that was uh, Bro Lee's hometown. Okay. So so it's like there's a little bit of a connection there. You know, a guy who's mm -hmm. very well associated with Brody Lee and coming in to restore yeah. order to the Dark Order. Right? Well, and, and you know what? And that would make <clears throat> sense. And I'd be okay yeah. with that. But the other thing is, like, the other thing that's getting me too, right, is like you have a ton of talent, right? At some point, stop just, you know, taking guys off the WWE scrap heap, even though they're, they're bringing good people, mm -hmm. right? And focus on what you have and make good things with what you have. Okay. Now, this is fun. I, I really want to touch on this because it's fun. Now, here's the interesting thing. I understand your point, and a lot of folks on social media say it. So then I have a question. So should we tell WWE to stop taking every, them off everybody else's scrap heap? Because they literally went on a hiring binge. The reason they could fire so many people and still have people on the roster is that they hired like 300 wrestlers in the last couple of years. Like literally hundreds. And then they've got more people going to the performance center now. And more. And more. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, I mean, having people in developmental is is good because you obviously want to keep your company going. Like you need, I guess you, but you the need developmental people in the pipeline. Developmental was hiring people like Adam Cole, who'd been wrestling for ten years. Uh Tommaso Ciampa is not a spring chicken. He's the champion. He's the NXT champion. So they literally went and hired these guys who had 10 years experience, 15 years experience for developmental. Yeah. So it's like WWE has been doing this literally for the last 10 years. So here's an important thing. This is really critical. And, and the thing is, your point is well taken. But I want to make, I want to make something abundantly clear. AEW has no business even being in the position where this is a valid critique. Because normally, two years into a company, they don't have TV. Two years into a company, they don't have pay-per-view. Two years in a company, they don't sell 20,000 tickets to a show. This is operated, this has been a company, a startup company in wrestling on steroids. All that hiring, it feels like, oh my God, you guys are hiring people every 10 seconds. The reality is that Tony Khan is like, look, I am going to be filling in this much TV time over the next year or two. And, t and t basically Turner and I have already talked. 
and the vision is possibly to expand Rampage to be two hours. So now I got two hours on this show, two hours on this show. I got dark and dark elevation. I actually have a lot of time that I can fill in theory. So I am going to need all those bodies when the moment comes. Right now it feels like it's too many because I actually don't have enough room on TV to fit all these pieces. Later I will. Later you'll be like, oh, how do you, you know, do you guys have enough people? It'll be the opposite. It's like, do you have enough people? It's like, yeah, actually we do because we did all the hiring first. Yeah. So what happens is you have to go on a hiring binge. And it's also when they become available. WBs, folks, their contracts keep running out. WB finds itself in this spot. And by the way, some of them will resign with WB. But the reality is WB is not offering anything. WB is in the spot where they're cutting payroll because they had already hired too many people. They've been on the opposite side of this equation. They had already done the mass hiring. And now they have too many people, nothing to do with them. So they start cutting them. Hmm. So even at the same time, yeah, he's hiring a lot of people, but he's not hiring 10, 15, 20. WBE would announce when they would add people to the Fort Worth Center, and it'd be five or 10 at a time. Are you getting five or 10 at a time? No. They hired this person, they hired this person. They brought in Adam Cole and Brian Danison on the same show. That's two. That's after CM Punk, three. Ruby Soho, four. Who's the other recent one? Sorry, sorry again? I just named four. Right. Who's the other Is reason? There an, Adam Cole? Did you say Adam Cole? I said Adam Cole, Brian Danielson, CM Punk, and Ruby Soho. Right. And then um, Christian Cage? That was a couple months ago. Literally okay, well, months that's ago. recent ish. That was like six months ago. Do you get my point? Yeah, yeah. It's not like dozens and dozens and dozens. The problem is we have such a short, short timeline with a lot of this stuff. It feels like, oh my God, you're hiring somebody every other week. No, you're not. <laughs> it, right now, this recent one was a couple within a couple of weeks of each other. So it actually felt a lot more tight and compressed than normal. But it's like, but then you had you had to go back months. The Christian Cage and Christian Cage wasn't brought in to be like a main eventer. He was being added to do certain things. And but a lot of these experienced guys are kind of operating there. And like, you know, Big Show and Mark Henry is like, oh my God, you keep hiring this WB guys. Mark Henry doesn't wrestle. Big Show doesn't really wrestle either. They've got like 10 shows, so they need to put people on commentary. Yeah. That's what they did. <laughs> Even though they just took Mark Henry off commentary. Yeah, no, but, uh, but he's not really great at commentary. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's got tons of experience and he'll be very helpful. And there's a lot of things they're doing that are very helpful, but it's not everything. And besides, I don't see you complaining about their biggest acquisition, Owen Hart. Oh, just... Hey, he's going to be in the video game. That'll be cool. I am going to get the AEW video game, I think. I, I think it'll be interesting. Um, but here's the thing. The Owen Hart one, the Owen Hart one made me laugh, though. Um, but it also makes the it, it actually makes the most sense. It amused me greatly. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's nice. It's nice to, for his legacy to be in wrestling again, right? Because obviously his widow wants nothing to do with WWE. Yeah. So it's it's nice to it's nice to have that connection, obviously for the fans and for for the foundation as well. And it's also her way of being like, screw you. WWE. Well, that too. Like literally, like, screw you. You will never get anything. So understandable though. I cannot yeah, no, blame for her. Sure. <laughs> anyway, it's like no. For sure. You are justified. You are justified, Martha Hart. Do what you wish. I just want to see. I just want to see uh, Ted DiBiase is all elite. Let's do it, Carlos. Just yeah, for the yeah. laugh. There you if go. If nothing else. Exactly. But anyway, bottom line, I get your point. Um, I do agree. There does need to be some more storyline elements of it. Uh, I'm going to give the guy the benefit of the doubt in some time because right now there's a lot of moving components. I will say though, and you you joked about it, but I do think they do need to hire a couple of people to help out with the storyline piece because right now Tony Khan has been taking all the weight on his shoulder, including running the company. He loves it. He's very passionate about it, but you can't be the booker, the writer, the owner, <laughs> the operator, the guy in the back. You can't try to be everything. Because but Vince McMahon does. But he didn't though. The, the best part about it is Vince McMahon convinced everybody he did everything. He sort he had his hand in everything, but he didn't actually do everything. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, because for years, people forget about him. Pat Patterson was like the mind behind a lot of stuff that was That's going true. on there. That's he true. He invented yeah. a lot of the stuff. Who's booking the Royal Rumble? Pat Patterson. Who's doing this other thing? Pat Patterson. Who's That's doing true. The, all these other guys yeah. are sitting there in the background doing, and he's got, and even Vince has his lieutenants. Bruce Pritchard and these other guys, those are his lieutenants. Okay, I can't be in 12 places at once. You go take care of that for me. Yeah, you yeah, go no. take care of that for me. For sure, for sure. You got to have those people though. You need your Pat Patterson, whoever that's going to be. You need this other person. You need this, that, and the other thing. Because then you can focus your attention on specific projects that you have a certain vision for that you really want it to happen a certain way. Yeah. Then you make sure that happens exactly. But in the meantime, your trusted lieutenants can be like, 
Okay, you take care of the women's division. Carlos, please fix it. I got this, man. I got it. <laughs> Done. Taken care of. But whatever it is, you need those people. Those people will help you because then, then it takes the pressure off of you and then your average product will improve because the stuff you're really focused in on, you are all in. Yeah. Pun intended. No, for sure. Makes sense? It does. I think that's a great place to wrap it up, Carlos. Sounds good. Now, as far as that's concerned, uh, real quick, last thing we'll say here, AW Rampage Grand Slam, pretty solid. I'm not going over the card here. Um, I'll say this. A lot of it, it did lose a little bit of luster from the uh, fatigue of the audience, although they were able to get amped up for certain pieces. And I will say the Adam Cole Young Bucks match, solid. Real good. Because Adam, Adam Cole and Young Bucks are great. And uh, Luchasaurus and those guys had some good spots in there too. It was pretty solid. Yeah, pretty solid. agreed. Yeah. Good stuff. So I think that's it for now. We'll have to see. Just checking to see if there's anything else. Nope, I think that's it. Okay, cool. So that'll be it for us this time around. We'll be back uh, uh, next week and probably talking a little more wrestling. We'll see if uh, Ric Flair gets himself in any more trouble. Yeah, are we sure there's no more Dark Side of the Ring? Is there? Is like Dark Side of the Ring, the rest of the transgressions of Ric Flair. The well, I mean, there will be another. Uh, <laughs> there will be another Dark Side of the Ring. So we'll see where we we'll see where that goes. It's like you just go in. It's like, what does this have to do with Ric Flair? Turns out, every, turns out, Ric Flair is like Kevin Bacon this way. Every horrible thing that has ever happened somehow relates to Ric Flair. And this we win. Because reasons. Anyway. All right. So you can check us out on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you get your audio version, video version, where you can see where you can see Dave's ex- excitement when I mentioned Jenny McCarthy earlier. You can check that out on the YouTube channel, Unnecessary Nonsense Podcast. And unfortunately, we ran out of time for Dave's soliloquy on Jenny McCarthy. Maybe we'll try again next episode. One day, maybe. Maybe. Soon. You never know. You never know. When her autograph when her autograph comes back after Dave sent his wonderful portrait of her, um, you know, that'll be a great day on the show. That'll be wonderful, I think. It would be if that would ever happen, but it's not going to happen. Live, dream, live the dream, Dave. Live the dream. Anyway, so that's it for us this time around. We will catch you in the next one.